Okay, so uh, let us uh, carry on where we left off yesterday. Uh, so we are, again, we're talking about the uh, Anusatis, uh, the uh, recollections, uh, and the purpose of these Anusatis is basically to give rise to a degree of uh, joy and happiness and gladness in the mind, uh, and then kind of that becomes then the starting point for the meditation practice. Uh, so that is kind of the idea here. Uh, so in a sense, it looks like the um, anusati, the recollection itself, it may look like that takes you all the way to samadhi, but very often it is the idea of combining the recollection with the um, meditation of it, like the breath, that's really what uh, kind of uh, uh, often gives the best results. So, so uh, this is, uh, so, we, so far we looked at the triple gem. The triple gem, things are very closely connected to each other. The Dhamma arising from the Buddha and the Sangha arising from that combination of Dhamma and the Buddha. And then, of course, the ethical conduct, which comes next, arises from the Dhamma as well and the Sangha, because ethical conduct is the, uh, uh, is the consequence of that. Yeah? So kind of one thing leading to another <coughs> in a kind of hierarchical sense here. Yeah? So we're going to look at the idea of ethics. Uh, the Pali word for ethics is sila, sila anusati, uh, the recollection of sila. And it means that you recall that you have been living well, uh, you've been doing the right thing, uh, you've been treating people well, you have been avoiding bad conduct, uh, etc., etc. Uh, and you remember that. And sometimes uh, it's one of those interesting things, Yeah, the, uh, how often in the world we're not really uh, encouraged to re uh, remember the good things that we have done. But on Buddhism, we're actually encouraged to do these things. Uh, because if it's done in the right way, it does not lead to a, a big ego. It actually leads just to a kind of quiet feeling good about yourself. Uh, and that is the idea here. Yeah, so it's not about building up a big ego and thinking you are the best. <laughs> I am the best. I'm a Buddhist. That's kind of what I sometimes I kind of <laughs> have to be careful what you say sometimes. Uh, uh, but um, it's just a quiet, peaceful sense that you are living a good life. Uh, that is a beautiful way of feeling about yourself. And what is kind of often, I think, the tragedy in the world is that I think almost everyone understands that kindness is equivalent to happiness. I think it's kind of intuitive. When you're kind, you feel good about it. It's kind of obvious. And I think the majority of people actually see it that way. And even though they see it that way, often they're not capable of living ethically or living morally. So it's like the, the habits of the past or the conditioning, uh, the um, sense of self that we have built up over a long period of time often blocks us uh, in our ability to live ethically uh, because uh, the, the habit pattern is so strong, the condition is so strong, it overrides uh, what we know deep down to be true and to be correct. Uh, and of course, when you see it that way, that other people are not capable of being ethical, even though they want to be ethical, uh, then you can again have compassion for them, yeah? And because then you are kind of, you understand that um, they are trapped in a sense, trapped in some kind of uh, sansaric, um, sansaric trap, yeah? Which kind of stops you from doing what actually you know is right. Uh, and then through that compassion, you can be even more ethical yourself and other people become more ethical as well. Uh. So uh, when we contemplate our ethics, uh, uh, one of the things to remember is that uh, ethical conduct is a kind of generosity. Uh, it's a higher kind of generosity. Uh, you're giving people not just material things that can sustain their material life, but you're giving people psychological things. Uh, yeah, you're giving people the freedom from fear. Uh, yeah, this is one of the things that you do when you live ethically, because unethical conduct leads to fear in other people. Uh, so you're providing freedom from fear. Uh, and freedom from fear means a life at ease when you can relax, you can just be with people and you don't, you know, you don't worry so much about the world. It's a, a world where there is violence and there's all kinds of problems. So it's a world that creates fear and problems and all kinds of psychological distress as a consequence. So giving the world a very high kind of gift by living ethically. Yeah? So remember that. Yeah? Remember that these five, even just the five precepts, even if it's only that much, you're off giving the world something very beautiful and powerful. Huh? So this is the first part of this. Uh, but not only are you giving them freedom from fear, if you 
live your ethical conduct if you take it further uh, and instead of just thinking about it as keeping precepts you're thinking about it in terms of being kind to other people uh, then you're giving that kindness is even more powerful yeah because kindness not only is it freedom from fear but you make people feel positively good if you're kind to them uh, yeah they feel a sense of uh, uplift they feel looked after they feel cared for they feel all of these extra things uh, that is even more powerful uh, so you're giving this kind of thing, this, this double thing to people. Freedom from fear on the one hand uh, and positive feelings on the other hand. Uh, and that's great, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> once you start to think like this uh, and you understand what you're doing through ethical conduct, uh, then it becomes even more interesting to live ethically, yeah, because it is an opportunity to be kind <laughs> to people at almost every opportunity, uh, yeah. To say things that will, uh, you know, uh, be a gift of your words, a gift of your conduct at all, all times. Uh, and what a wonderful thing that is to be able to give to people at all times. Yeah, Here you are, this is my gift to you. Uh, and don't worry too much about if the other person is grumpy uh, or they have a bad day or they are not kind in return. That's kind of irrelevant uh, because, okay, maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they are grumpy. Uh, maybe it's not really working out for them. Uh, but why is that? Well, it's because of the cause and conditions of samsara. Of course, people are grumpy sometimes. Uh, and if people are a bit grumpy, then you give them a hug and you give them a pat on the back and you say, it's okay, I allow you to be grumpy. <laughs> and it was, Ajahn Brahm has this kind of beautiful idea of he, he gives people a certificate. He used to give them a happiness certificate. Uh, yeah, you're allowed to be happy for whatever reason, uh, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, but later on, there was this, this young woman. She, not, she's not that young anymore now, but she came from <laughs> Singapore and Indonesia. Uh, and she was a bit of a grumpy character. And she said, I don't really want a happiness certificate. I want a grumpiness certificate. Can you please give me a grumpiness certificate? And so we gave her a grumpiness certificate. I allow you to be grumpy for whatever reason, without any kind of, you know, without let or whatever it is that he, he wrote on the certificate. And that's kind of nice, yeah? Because when you are allowed to kind of just be who you are sometimes, it takes some of the pressure off. And often the grumpiness disappears more quickly if you do that. So it's okay. So you can be you're, you're grumpy today. That's okay. You can be grumpy today. And so we kind of we, it, the whole thing, yeah, revolves around kindness and compassion and and uh, being kind to people. This way, accepting people for what they are, uh, not trying to make people any different from what they are. Uh, it's that uh, you know when other people want to control us, they want to make us different. Uh, it puts pressure on us, uh, and it kind of makes life more miserable sometimes. Uh, and often that stops us from actually becoming better people, because instead of looking at the deep causes within that uh, you know, stops us from being kind, uh, we just try to please other people instead. Uh, we don't actually deal with the kind of root issues and the root problems in our conduct. Uh, so just allowing other people to be is also a beautiful gift. Yeah, It's okay. Yeah, You can be who you are. Uh, and that is a, is a gift as well to other people. So all of these things are gifts to the world. Yeah? And when we do these things, we have a very good reason to feel good about ourselves as a consequence. But not only is it a gift to others, but ethical conduct is a gift to yourself. Yeah? When you are kind to others, when you live in the right way, actually you are purifying yourself. And there is an automatic, you can't avoid feeling better about yourself if you do this. It is also a gift to yourself. And sometimes you don't really have to reflect on your ethical conduct at all. You just know that you're doing the right thing. So when you close your eyes, you just feel good about yourself. Yeah, You know that you're a good person. And if other people say you're bad, you shrug your shoulders and you don't care what they say because you know deep inside that you are doing, living in the right way. That means that you are also more free from other people's judgment and all of these kind of things. That's kind of a very beautiful thing. So uh, this is how you develop, can develop carefully, very gently this idea of uh, recollecting your ethical conduct in these various ways, uh, yeah, remembering that what you're doing, uh, understanding that and kind of feeling a good, a warm feeling about yourself uh, because you know that you're doing the right thing. Uh. So uh, let's look at this in a little bit more detail, how this is described in this particular sutta. So uh, you recollect your ethical conduct uh, and uh, so this is uh, how it starts out, which is unbroken, impeccable, spotless, and unmarred. So this uh, is the 
uh, conduct of the stream engine because the stream engine have of course their conduct is going to be virtually impeccable yeah they're not going to make any many mistakes we're talking here about the mahanama who has entered the stream and so for the stream enter they live very very well and uh, for our, for the rest of people who are not stream mentors, okay, you have to uh, approximate to this, yeah. So you are you maybe not completely unbroken, but mostly unbroken, yeah. Occasional breaks in your in your habits, uh, in your good habits, uh, and that's okay. But the idea here is that you want to make it as good as you possibly can. Uh, the better it is, uh, the more powerful uh, this recollection is going to be. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, kind of the idea here. Uh, um, if you, your conduct is not 100%, if you find that you have certain weaknesses, don't, please don't get upset with yourself for that. That is just the way it is. That's the way your conditioning is. And that's okay. If you get upset for, with yourself for bad conduct, actually you make it worse. So you just kind of try to figure out how to move forward in this particular case. It is important to make it as impeccable as possible because even though it is true that you can forgive yourself, Forgiveness only goes so far. Yeah? Forgiveness is, uh, there's a limit to what forgiveness can do. And one of the reasons why forgiveness is limited uh, is because we have a sense of self. And that sense of self will tend to take on responsibility. Yeah? That's the problem with the sense of self. This is what the sense of self is. The sense of self thinks that you are the doer. And because it thinks that you are the doer, well, then you become responsible as well. Yeah? And that's kind of the problem. Yeah? So this is the reason why we contemplate non-self, because the contemplation of non-self, one of the things it does, it allows us to be more forgiving. Yeah? Because the more you understand that it's cause and conditions, not the self, the more you understand that, of course, if you are just the victim of cause and conditions, of course, you're worthy of forgiveness. Yeah? Each one of us is worthy of forgiveness because of that. So you can see how all the various ideas in Buddhism, they kind of come together very beautifully. Yeah? And so the non-self idea is something that has very practical implications in this way. It allows you to forgive, allows you to forgive yourself, allows you to forgive others. Because the implication of non-self is that we are the product of the past, the product of conditioning. And therefore, in the end, we are not responsible, really. Yeah? It's a kind of a dangerous thought, because the moment you think you're not responsible, you think, yay, I can do what I want. But that's kind of the wrong takeaway <laughs> for that one. Yeah, so that's why it is tricky. Um, so even though ultimately you're not responsible, you are bound to take some of the responsibility because of your sense of self. And so you will judge yourself to some extent. And that's why it is important to have be impeccable as possible and then forgive to the best of our ability. How is it possible to become completely impeccable in conduct? It sounds... It may sound really hard, and of course the answer is through metta and compassion. That's how you become impeccable in these things. If you have that metta and compassion mind behind everything you do, then your conduct starts to become really, really spotless as a consequence. That is in the kind of in the final analysis, if you like. That is what you have to do to have spotless conduct. <clears throat> so this is the first part of the idea of. Impeccable, spotless conduct, unmarred, that's kind of, I don't know where Bhante Sajjata got that word from, but uh, unmarred, un, I think it means like unspotless pretty much. Uh, liberating, uh, yeah, uh, this is kind of a really nice idea uh, of um, the idea of good conduct. It liberates you. Uh, you feel liberated inside. Uh, and so bad conduct traps you inside. You are trapped by defilements, trapped by negative thoughts, trapped by all these things. You feel bad about yourself, trapped by bad feelings. Good feelings are liberating. You know what, it, what it's like when you feel good about yourself, yeah? When you have a happy day, everything feels great. It's a, lib it's a liberation of the mind. Uh, but when you feel bad about yourself, and especially if there comes some bad conduct, you feel trapped by that. Uh, you feel like you can't get out of that state and you, you, that state limits you in a certain way. You can't express yourself properly. You lose your creativity and your ability to think clearly. All the things, everything goes out of the window when you are trapped by these negative qualities. So it's liberating. And it's the uh, exactly opposite of what many people in the world think. They think that non 
morality is liberating because then you can do what you want. Uh, that is a very shallow kind of liberation. Uh, yeah, it is a very kind of doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, what matters is what where our minds are at, uh, whether our minds are liberated, not whether we can express ourselves uh, physically or, or verbally, you know, in whatever way we want. That is a very shallow thing which doesn't really go very far. Uh, so it liberates you when you are kind. That's nice, isn't it? Uh, you become liberated by being kind. Uh, there's something very, um, uh, very tangible and powerful about that. Uh, so, um, buddhisa is the Pali word for this. Uh, it's praised by the wise people. Uh, vinyu is a, the sensible people here again. Sensible people, wise people, praise uh, kindness. Uh, and sometimes that's enough yeah, to kind of undertake these things. Uh, the good people in the world, the Buddha, anyone who is sensible praises these things. Uh, it's the bad people who don't praise virtue. Uh, and so who do you want to be praised by? Do you want to be praised by all the dodgy characters in the world or do you want to be praised by the good people in the world? Uh, it's like, uh, you know, do you want to be praised by Ajahn Brahm or do you want to be praised by, uh, who is a dodgy character in Malaysia? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Too, there are too many. There's, there's many of them. Okay, okay. So always some dodgy, dodgy characters around. So yeah. Uh, anyway, whoever whoever it might be, you, you choose. You, you choose your dodgy person, and and it's kind of obvious who you want to be praised by, right? It's kind of kind of you know, it's kind of obvious. If uh, so some people praise you and you think great, other people praise you, think all right, whatever. It kind of doesn't really matter so much. Uh, and uh, it's kind of praise is a dangerous thing because we can become victims to be pr to, to praise, uh, and we become kind of trapped by praise. Uh, praise can be used to manipulate people. Yeah, people who are psychologically astute they will use praise to manipulate you, uh, and uh, that is kind of uh, dangerous. Uh, uh, so people like people who are wise they don't praise that much. They praise very kind of carefully, very rarely, uh, and uh, that I think is the right way of doing it. Uh, Okay, uh, not, mista not mistaken, uh, aparamatta. Uh, yeah. So this, what this really means, it means not grasp, that's what it means. So the, because we're talking about the stream enter here, the stream enter don't grasp their virtue anymore because for them it becomes natural, yeah, it's part of who they are. Uh, so that does not mean that you should not grasp it unless you are a stream mentor, of course. But if you're not the stream mentor, please grasp the virtue a little bit uh, because that is a requirement for being virtuous. Uh, sometimes people think that um, one of the three fetters to be abandoned to become a stream mentor is uh, silabhata paramasa, which means the grasping of uh, virtue and observances, yeah, virtues and vows. Uh, and so they think that that means I must stop grasping the virtue, otherwise I can't become a stream mentor. That actually is the wrong way of thinking about it uh, because it is not meant as a means to becoming a stream mentor. It is the result that happens when you become a stream mentor. So you grasp it uh, until you become a stream mentor and then you let go of the grasping. It's automatic. It's not a part of the path. It's just the result of the path. And then leading to stillness. Yeah, the idea that uh, virtue... It leads to samadhi. Samadhi is the word here, here again. Samadhi sangvattanika is the Pali. So uh, virtue leads to stillness. Uh, and uh, you can see here that uh, what is meant here by virtue and ethics is obviously very profound. Yeah? Otherwise it doesn't lead to stillness. And again, it has to do with the whole idea of uh, inclining the mind towards metta and compassion and all of these kind of things. Uh, and that is where stillness really becomes a part of the uh, the idea of virtue. Yeah. And you see this again, this, so this is always the fascinating thing about the sutta, as you see the same message again and again and again in slightly different angles. Uh, before we talked about um, how sila is the support for anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing in satipatthana, now there's a support for samadhi. And of course it's the same thing, yeah, because samadhi, satipatthana also leads to stillness. Uh, so it all kind of comes together in this way. Yeah. So it leads to stillness. So without uh, a virtue, uh, there is no stillness, basically. Uh, and that's, this is why it is powerful. Uh. So uh, 
all of these things are helpful in remembering and recollecting to be happy about your virtue. It liberates you, it leads to stillness, it's praised by the wise, all of these positive things. So, um, okay. Then, what do we have? When a noble <coughs> disciple recollects the ethical conduct, their mind is not full of desire, ill will, and confusion. Yeah, when you remember the ethical conduct, then your mind is on the spiritual path, uh, talking, thinking about spiritual things. Uh, and that is counter to all of the defilements of the mind, uh, especially when you have a mind of metta and compassion. Uh, of course, you don't have any ill will, but you also don't tend to have any greed. Uh, yeah, you don't tend to have desires because that mind which is full of metta, it is a mind which is satisfied. Uh, yeah, you don't need anything else when you have metta. You feel a sense of fulfillment within. That is the whole idea of metta and compassion. And so that, for that reason, your desires tend to fall away as well. So it is much more than just the counteracting of ill will. It has all these additional benefits. And it's also a countering of delusion or confusion. Because a, ma a mind of ill will is often has clarity to it. Yeah, the, uh, the, the clarity that comes with uh, not having the other defilements. Uh, and so it has all of these kind of beautiful uh, additional uh, benefits here. So you don't have any, and then the, the mind is, as I said before, it is just straight, yeah, ujjo. Uh, unswerving was a Bhante Sujato's uh, term, but it kind of comes down to straight based on the sila. And the mind that is straight is the mind that uh, uh, is. Uh, inspired yeah, by uh, the uh, Dhamma and the meaning. And when you're inspired by the Dhamma and the meaning, you get joy connected uh, with the Dhamma. Yeah, and then this whole process happens, uh, going from joy to uh, rapture, from rapture to tranquility, from tranquility to, to happiness, from happiness to samadhi. And then if you want to go beyond samadhi, it takes you even beyond samadhi to seeing things according to reality or whatever. But here it is more about living in balance among people who are unbalanced, uh, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. Uh, they enter the stream of the teaching and develop recollection of their ethics uh, or their morality. Uh. So that is uh, the uh, using the idea of ethics uh, as a foundation for joy. And, this, and uh, so uh, there you are. Uh. So let's do a little bit of meditation again. <clears throat> All right, any questions or comments from anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, morning, Ajahn. Uh, the, just backtrack a little bit to uh, yesterday when we talked at the recollection of the Sangha. Mm. Uh, just some question on translation. Um, so, Pandit Sujato had this practicing the way that's good, direct, systematic, and proper. In most renditions, we normally quite familiar with Patipana uh, means uh, conduct, so of good conduct. So, Su Patipana, of good conduct. Uh, then, of upright conduct. Then, of wise conduct, of dutiful conduct. That's, that's our standard. Really? Yeah, that's what we chant. Mm, but it's probably not, I don't think that's a, such a, the ideal translation, let's put it that way, because uh, this Patipana is like the. Uh, the general practice of the whole path, uh, patipajati is the, the verb, uh, and it means like an overall practice. Uh, uh, I think if you say conduct, usually the way that I'm used to using that term usually refers more to kind of the ethics or sila or the conduct like of a Buddha or something. Yeah. But here we're talking about the practice of the whole path. Yeah. So the fact that you have internalized the Noble Eightfold Path as a stream enter, uh, and you're practicing the, noble, the full Noble Eightfold Path, uh, I don't know what when you use, use the word conduct. How do you think about it? Do you think about it in terms of uh, the whole path, or uh, more like ethics? Uh, yeah, I think most people will say that the sangha is of this well, conduct of good conduct, of upright conduct, of wise conduct, of dutiful conduct. That, yeah. That's the usual right um, verse that we usually uh, recite. Okay. Yeah, I think that I think yeah. it's a little bit problematic because that would normally then mean that the sangha is. Um, Kind of ethically, yeah, ethically upright and doing the right, right kind of ethics. Uh, but this here refers to everything on the path, like right view and right samadhi and right uh, everything. Uh, 
So maybe the word conduct there is, um, is a little bit too narrow, perhaps. I, I don't know, yeah, depending on how you understand the word, because words are understood differently by different people. But uh, it might be too narrow. Uh, and so I think uh, practicing is, uh, is uh, probably a better translation. I think if you look at uh, Vicky Bode, he also has, trans he has the same thing, I think, practicing. Uh, have you looked at Vicky Bode's translation? Uh, let's see if we can find it here. Uh, yeah. Vicky Bode. Mm. Where, where are we? Ah, there is no translation by Vicky Bode for, for this one. Um, I have. I, are you? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. That's, that's great. Yeah. One to one. Okay. So I have to. Oh. How do I do this? Just scroll. Scroll. Just. Uh, no, here, no, okay. Ah, I scroll, ah, this way, I scroll that way. Ah, okay, it's like a book, isn't it? Uh, I forgot about that, it yeah. Book. It is a book, okay. Mm. How do I go backwards now? Uh, to the left. Tap to the left. Ah, okay, I think I got it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. So, okay, this is Kindle these days. It looks quite nice, actually. It's old. It's old, is it? Uh, yeah, the text is quite nice. Okay, anyway, so... Um, yeah, so Bikki Bodhi also has practicing here. Yeah, Bhante Sujato practicing. So, uh, so I think that is kind of the uh, accepted word. Now, let us, you know, the best, sometimes the really good place to go for these kind of things is to go to a dictionary, because dictionaries, they will often have like uh, the, the kind of the whole variety of meanings of a particular word. Yeah. It gives the whole breadth of words. So, this is the Margaret Cohen's dictionary. Uh, which is kind of the latest Pali dictionary published by the Polytech Society. This is the state of the art dictionary, uh, and it's, uh, it's quite a good one. <laughs> so uh, we have um, Patipanna. Let's see, we have Patipanna here. Uh, so. Um, This is the thing when you ask a question like this, uh, Niwa, and then uh, it takes, usually you can have a long discussion about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so pati pajati. So this is the verb I was talking about. You can see here at the top here, pati pajati. I don't know if you can read any of this tiny little text, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, this is a dictionary. Dictionaries usually are very, let's see if I can expand it a bit more. Ding, ding, ding. Does that help? Yeah, so there you have patipajati, that's the verb. Um, it's so large, it doesn't fit on the page anymore. Patipajati. So here you have patipajati, uh, steps upon, enters upon, goes along, follows, uh, follows a way of action, proceeds, uh, acts, applies oneself, undertakes, practices, behaves, conducts oneself. So you actually have conduct oneself there towards the end of of these things. But you can see most of the usages here are of the kind of practicing, like following, proceeding, acting, that kind of in that ballpark of meaning, basically. So that is um, uh, the usual meaning. And certainly when it comes to the Noble Eightfold Path, I would say that is the meaning. To, yeah, so this is another use, obtain, or this is some other kind. Let's see if we can find Patipanna as well, because again, direct. Patipanna is the past participle of patipajati, so like the past tense, if you like. Yeah. So, uh, so here you go, patipanna, right at the bottom there. Can you see patipanna down here? Ah, why does it do that? That's evil. Uh, there you are, <laughs> patipanna. So, uh, uh, one who has entered upon the path entering, following the path, going along, who is approached, arrived, acting, applying oneself, practicing. Uh, and then you have conducting oneself here towards the end here as well. Uh, uh, but it might be that conducting oneself here is meant conduct in the sense of practice. So it, it, these words can have different meanings, obviously, in English as well. Uh, let's see if we have the... Uh, are, you, are you happy already? Are you getting... Yeah, I'm, I'm happy, but I think, I think there's a lot of... Uh... Those who grew up in, in, you know, chanting these, and that seems to be the usual 
rendition. The you don't understand. Okay. Of, of, you know, and then even the words yeah. are, uh, I'll say, so you have good, which is good conduct usually, yeah. and then you have direct, which is normally translated as upright. As what? Upright. Upright. Upright, upright, con upright, upright conduct. Of upright conduct. Upright conduct. Okay. Yeah. And then you have the yeah. systematic, then they, they translate as wise conduct. Wise conduct. Yeah, yeah. And then you yeah. have the okay. uh, proper, which is translated as dutiful conduct. Dutiful conduct. Okay. So duties. Yeah. It's, it's all kind of ballpark, right? Yeah. Not, none of this is actually com is actually wrong as such. Uh, but uh, uh, I think um, I think these later translations probably are are preferable, to be honest. Uh, yeah, so here, here you have it. So this has the systematic conduct. Yeah, the Nyaya in the suttas. I mean, you said it was the, what did you say again? Wise. Wise, yeah. So this is conduct according, basically according to dependent origination or dependent cessation. So wise, again, it's not entirely wrong, but I think it is, um, it's kind of not also, not very, uh, it's not really um, specific enough yeah, to capture the meaning because uh, so many words in the Pali can be ca called wise, and if every word is called wise, then you kind of lose, you lose some of the nuance of the of the original, if you know what I mean. Uh, so, uh, yeah, duty, proper, yeah, samichi. Uh, I think I think again, proper is preferable to duty. Uh, to be honest, uh, duty is usually vatta and that sort of thing. Uh, is duty in Pali? Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, that's good. This is nice. These are nice little things, you know, because they uh, clarify things. So uh, that's that's good that you bring these things up, actually. Uh, okay. Anyone else like to say anything about this? Uh, yeah. Please fire away. Hi, Ajahn. Yeah. Um, for the sila anusati. Yeah. What can you please uh, explain more? What does it mean? Not mistaken. Not mistaken, yeah. The, 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 this I think is not a good translation. Not grasped is the best is a better translation. Uh, that's literally what it means. Paramatta, uh, paramasa means to hold or grasp something. That's literally what it means. Uh, and I suggest I, maybe Bhante Sujato was uh, wondering, kind of, how should this be understood? What do you mean, not grasped? Yeah, what does this actually mean? Because, uh, um, uh, yeah. Because the point is that you know you are supposed to grasp things a little bit beforehand, uh, and then uh, so he, I think he probably was wondering kind of what how to kind of get out the proper meaning of it. But I think he has actually misunderstood maybe a little bit here. I'm not sure exactly what has happened. Uh, uh, but the idea is that you know you when you become a stream enter, you no no longer need to hold on to the virtue because it becomes who you are. You become a virtuous person. You are a virtuous person. It becomes part of who you are. It's your, your identity or your psychology becomes virtuous. Not identity, because that kind of uh, becomes too much of a sense of self again, but uh, your psychology becomes virtuous uh, because you understand the urgency and the importance of virtue. Uh, and this is why we should all try to be more like stream enters, yeah? because they understand that urgency. And as it says in the sutta, we should act as if our hair is on fire. Uh, if your hair was, is, was on fire, would you act quickly? Uh, you probably act very quickly, right? Uh, or if your hat is on fire, yeah, you probably think, okay, I better. You don't think, oh yeah, I can just relax. I'll put it out, put it out later on. No, you put out the fire straight away, yeah. Otherwise, you've had it, you've finished. Uh, and so this is the kind of the idea of the stream map. They understand the urgency of sila or virtue, uh, and so they act straight away, uh, and it's part of what they are. So we want to go there, but to be able to go there, we have to hold on to it a little bit. Uh, if you don't hold on to the five precepts or whatever, as soon as a little bit of desire comes up, you're going to go with the desire rather than the precepts. So think, you say, stop, no. Okay, this is dangerous. So there's a little bit of holding there to be able to make it work. And so because this particular sutta really is about stream enters, that's why it says not holding, not grasping. But for everyone else, a bit of grasping is, uh, is positive. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so could it be something like the breath, like in meditation, you're not grasping the breath? Yeah, I, well, I think um, I think in um, in meditation, yes, it's true. Uh, you don't grasp it too much, uh, and you're not supposed to kind of grasp, of course, the sila too much. Uh, you know, you know, in a sense that uh, you um, it becomes painful or whatever. Uh, uh, but you have a commitment to it, uh, and that commitment 
is yeah, you have also have a commitment to the breath, but there's probably a little bit of holding to the breath anyway, you see. Even when you kind of try to let it go, is that letting it go completely probably probably is beyond you. You probably can't do that. Uh, it's just letting go as far as you possibly can. Uh, but the mind is always holding on a little bit. Uh, so uh, I would say uh, yes. I, th I think it's just call it commitment, if you like, yeah, to, to virtue. Uh, uh, but that is also a little bit of grasping in that commitment, I think. Uh, yeah. Atano sila ni anusarati. Atano is atta self. Doesn't mean one self, right? It's just uh, the self. Which one? Where is this? Recollects their own. Recollects their own ethical product is atano ah. sila ni anusarati. Yeah, yeah. Atano. One self. Yeah. But one self. Not just a self. Yeah, one self. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, atta. You very the most common meaning of atta in the suttas is one self. Yeah, is that what it's called a reflexive pronoun? No, one self. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ajahn. Yeah. Um, I. Uh, just just now, Ajahn mentioned that uh, one who has meta will um, have a, a good conduct, and um, I I wonder if there's any um, is it based? It makes sense, but then um, is it really just having good meta will uh, once I will become uh, virtuous naturally? Or uh, is there any basis in the sutta? Right. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, any basis in the Sutta for that idea? Yeah. Uh, is there any basis in the Sutta for it? Um, uh, good question. I, I don't know. I think it's just I think it's just the common sense. If your mind is full of kindness, you can't act co contrary to that. Yeah, it's kind of obvious. It's impossible. If your mind is very pure and you feel uh, love for everyone, uh, you you can't hurt someone you love yeah, or someone you kind of you like you're very close to. That's kind of what that's the consequences of that uh, of that mental attitude in a sense. Uh, the same with compassion. You know, if you have compassion for somebody, you don't hurt them. You that's kind of what compassion means that you don't hurt them. Uh, does it say in the suttas? I think I think it says that no no kind of limited action exists uh, when you have uh, the, the full metta and these things. So all the limited actions, which are actions of bad conduct, basically, uh, they are destroyed at a particular point. Uh, so that's the consequences of that. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm sure, I mean, it is implied very obviously, in my opinion, but like, specific mentions, not sure. Uh, not sure. Maybe you can find it uh, way wrong. You can tell me later on. <laughs> See what happens. It's probably in there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, on that note, Ajandi is translated here as ethics, and usually we understand sila as or ethics in the in the manner of keeping the precepts. Mm. Uh, but you seem to mention that it's broader than just. Just, just that is is ethics. Yeah. Then, when people look look at ethics, it means do the do's and don'ts. Yeah, you know. So, is, yeah. is there any any other right way to understand that as a, as a whole when we talk about ethics and sila? Yeah, exactly. So ethics is like ethics is often very similar to the idea of morality in English, uh, and uh, morality is more about the don'ts than the do's. Uh, it's kind of focus on the don'ts usually. Uh, so morality, you know, in English language, morality means you don't do bad things. Uh, and uh, yes, it is much more than the five precepts. They keep in the five precepts is a good start, uh, but you can do many bad things and keep to keep the five precepts. Uh, yeah, and the five precepts says you shouldn't kill any living beings. But what about torturing living beings? Is that okay? <laughs> of course, it's not okay, right? And so it's actually much broader. Uh, and right speech in the suttas is very broad. The the samavacha. But in the five precepts, it's just lying that is mentioned there. So again, it is much broader than that. So we should broaden it out, include everything. Yeah, And this is why it is useful sometimes just to ask oneself, what is motivating me in this particular case? Am I motivated by kindness and by compassion? Or am I motivated by ill will and harming? And that motivation is ultimately what decides whether something is ethical or not, whether it's good or not. 
So yeah, please don't be satisfied with the five precepts. Yeah, that's uh, you can still do many bad things and give the five precepts. So don't do any bad things at all. That's kind of the idea. Um, and also do good things. Yeah, turn it around. Uh, remember that uh, uh, ethical conduct in the Buddhist sense of sila is actually doing good things deliberately, having compassion, acting out of compassion, being generous, not not just not stealing here. Yeah. Um, having good speech, kind speech, not just avoiding bad speech, etc., etc., and then eventually bringing it back to the mind level. And when the mind is purified, then the ethics become uh, automatic in a sense.